Welcome to Wisdom Talk Radio, a collaborative community of explorers in conscious living. I remember the first time I read Viktor Frankl's profoundly moving book, Man's Search for Meaning. It was a long time ago. I was in high school and it spoke even then to my own deeper questions about life. And it really confirmed my draw to study psychology when I left high school and went to college. And then recently, just a few weeks ago, I had a, what I will call a provoking conversation um, with a man whose life work is with the intersection of purpose, of meaning, of spirituality, and transition. And I'm really excited to see where our conversation goes today. So, so listen in. I'm Laurie Seymour, host of Wisdom Talk Radio and CEO and founder of the Baca Institute. What's your creative innovator style? Find out your life advantage by taking the creative interview, in, innovator quiz, if I can say it, Open your ability to flow so that you can work with your natural talents and not against them. Learn to optimize your ability to create more in less time while enjoying every minute. My guest today is Rabbi Dr. Baruch Halevi, Rabbi B, who is a longtime logotherapist, Enneagram coach, Kabbalah teacher, inspirational author, motivational speaker and co-founder and executive director of Soul Centered, a Denver, Colorado-based center for spirituality, meaning, and healing. Synthesizing his training and expertise in logotherapy, meaning-centered psychotherapy, the Enneagram, an ancient spiritual personality and energy system, and Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, Baruch works with clients to find deeper meaning and greater purpose through all of life's transitions, traumas, and tragedies. Living what he calls, and I love this, the Defiant Spirit. And he is host of the Defiant Spirit podcast. Welcome, Baruch. I'm so delighted you are here. Or would you prefer that I call you Rabbi B? Uh, or just B. Uh, or just B. Most people could just call me B, but whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm just okay. honored to be here. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Baruch is familiar to me, so... You you say know. it nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm from Nebraska, so my friends butchered it, so I just ended uh, up as B. So. Got it. Got it. I understand that. <laughs> so anyway, welcome to Wisdom Talk Radio, Thanks. and I, I really am uh, looking forward to today's, to today's conversation. And Maybe a good place to start is, you know, is what do you mean by the defiant spirit? You know, we're talking about meaning and purpose, and I know we'll we'll probably talk a lot about that. But yes, um, yes. more importantly, what does my mentor and teacher, Dr. Viktor Frankl, mean? It's his term. What he ultimately said. So, for for those who are listening and may not know, um, Dr. Viktor Frankl was. Um, a psychiatrist prior to the Holocaust and had founded what you beautifully described, logotherapy, uh, meaning-centered psychotherapy, as a pathway to healing. You know, prior to um, relatively recently, medicine, I guess, still is to this day, um, and, and mental health is focused on what's broken, not what's whole. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Frankel's thesis was in order to be whole, we must turn to that which is already whole and always whole, which is our, he called it the noetic, um, but we would translate it as the spirit. And so what he said was that at the center of each and every one of each and every one of us, there's a defiant power of human spirit that's always healed, that's always whole, that can never be broken. And he turned to that not only in his psychotherapy and his practice, but in his life, uh, unfortunately, as he was a victim of the Holocaust, um, his wife, unborn child, parents, brother, family, friends were murdered. Um, he was reduced to a number by the Nazis, prisoner 119104. And yet he was never that number and he was never reduced because what he said was he had the defiant power of the human spirit to get him through and spent the, the remainder of his life as a survivor after the Holocaust, um, teaching others this, 
mm -hmm. uh, how to discover and live the defiant power of the human spirit. And that's, <clears throat> that's what I mean by it. I try mm -hmm. to aspire towards that. I certainly have not been through that, but I, my feeling is if this man and others like him can defy their darkness and the circumstances of their life, so can I, so can we. Mm. Oh, that's, that's beautifully said. And, you know, I, I think about the people who have been great teachers and been great teachers for me. And I, I, I know that their experiences, and it's not necessarily trauma or traumatic events, um, but my teacher Dawn would experience so much energy in her body because it was it was about raising the vibration the vibratory level in their cells and she underwent great change almost continually and it was like burning from the inside out mm -hmm. and yet she was always joyful yeah. and and what she got to bring and demonstrate to those of us who were studying with her was or one of the things was a kind of a stepping down to those of us who are not necessarily having to go through the Holocaust, but can recognize the truths that are there inherent in that. Well, Dr. Frankel said every one of us will has or will endure a personal concentration camp. Mm -hmm. um, and if you live life, you will. I mean, you know, it, it, we are literally being concentrated, reduced by circumstances, by loss, by pain, by suffering. Just turn on the news and you can't help but feel if you have you know, any human empathy, what's happening in Ukraine as we're recording this. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's heartbreaking, shattering, but that's when we must turn to what your teacher is talking about, that higher vibration, mm -hmm. the noetic, the spirit, the true self, whatever you want to call it, tapping into that higher source or that inner mm -hmm. source as a, as a pathway through the low vibrations, the darkness. How does um, your study in, in the Kabbalah come into this? I mean, Kabbalah was an important part of my life at one point where I spent a couple of years studying the Kabbalah, studying um, and how it, particularly at that time, how it connected with the tarot. Um, yeah. and, but the Kabbalah to me is like uh, a way of, of looking at everything in life, at flow, at energy. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned to your audience, I, I am an ordained rabbi. I did practice uh, in a, as a congregational rabbi for about 18 years. Um, I found my, I walked away from Judaism after my bar mitzvah, I think probably like a lot of young people. And I found my way back to it vis-a-vis -vis, um, Buddhism, Hinduism and yoga. Uh -huh. um, other spiritual That's a story unto itself, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I met more, you know, today there are more teachers teaching um, yoga that were born, or sorry, Buddhism that were born Jewish than were born Buddhist. So there's a lot of people searching out of the Jewish tradition. I think in part, we could talk about it because of the Holocaust, because we went into a, a fearful reaction, understandably, after, you know, we were nearly annihilated. Mm -hmm. And I think we really circled the wagons. And in that process, in that fear, we lost a lot of the spiritual seekers who weren't, you know, looking for a fear based anything. I wanted mm -hmm. inspiration. And I found it in other people's uh, traditions. Mm -hmm. I found my way back to Judaism, almost, you know, coincidentally, but not, I think there's a divine plan playing out. Mm -hmm. I found my way back vis-a-vis -vis Kabbalah, because what I found in Kabbalah was a universal, uh, accessible spirituality. You don't need to be Jewish to mm -hmm. explore Kabbalah. There's, it's not a dogma. There's no do's and don'ts, have to's. It's a, like you described, it's a way of looking at the world. And as I think of it, it's a very um, intellectual person's spirituality, very sophisticated. It's a mind-based spirituality. Mm -hmm. Now I have body-based spirituality like yoga. I do yoga almost every day. And mm -hmm. so there's just different pathways to that energy. But one of those ways is through thinking. And I've, I've never found a spiritual tradition more thoughtful, thinking focused than Kabbalah. I think of it as almost the blueprints of divinity or the blueprints of your soul. And it's sophisticated mm -hmm. approach to understanding, you know, it's not heaven and earth. It's not, I'm alive and I'm dead. There's nuance, there's complexity. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with a thinking person's spirituality in Kabbalah and spent the um, past 25 years teaching it. And, and for many of those years as a congregational rabbi, but I left the congregational world because I felt confined. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, I was never that interested in teaching any particular type of person. I just want to live this and teach this mm -hmm. to whomever 
does not matter to me. And so I left about seven years ago. I'm also an entrepreneur. So I followed some entrepreneurial things, but my, my heart and soul is with Kabbalah and as it relates to Dr. Frankel, which I'm happy to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd love to know that about that, that connection, because um, for me, that that's not something that I, you know, there were two different times in my life where that studying was happening. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I love how you're describing the Kabbalah, which is, and yes, we both pronounce it differently and that's okay. Um, well, there's, there's multiple pronunciations. <laughs> exactly. of it, so, yeah. um, it, and that is, as that as that nuanced way of looking at the world, um, I came my personally out of being a more mm, I don't want to say linear, although I could, but you know that that mental way of being with the world, and I had to come into my body and come into a whole other way of connecting with spirit than that way. But I love that for you, it it brought something um, that tapped into something in you. That acknowledge something in you. Yeah, I'm also, so I have three passions, Kabbalah, logotherapy, and the Enneagram. And the mm -hmm. Enneagram, which is an ancient personality, psychological kind of assessment and roadmap, says that we have three wisdom centers. We have the mind, we have the heart, and we have the gut or the body. Mm -hmm. And in the West, you know, we live like we're a <laughs> neck up, right? right? Like we happen to have a body, but we are a head. And we're all of those things. And, you know, for me, I've, I'm a spiritual mutt. I just can't find the answer. I can't find the path. I don't, I'm an Enneagram eight for any of your listeners. So I defy the box. I just can't breathe in a box. So, you know, it was a job hazard. Must like, be. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. <laughs> Monotheism, you know, like commit. And, you know, this, and it was very hard for me to color inside the lines. So I really draw from different traditions. Every morning I sit in Buddhist mindfulness meditation practice. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think if we can borrow best practice and, and build our own vehicle, because in the end, you know, a teacher of mine once said, we have a fingerprint that's uniquely ours. We have a soul print that's uniquely mm -hmm. ours. We've got to cobble together a path that makes sense and resonates with us. Mm -hmm. So borrowing from these great traditions is what I've been doing. Yeah. And so where does that bring you to this today? So you've been you yeah. have been bringing together these traditions, but you are not the traditions. No, you know, I uh, more than those. So, yeah. how would you how would you speak to that? Yeah, um, well, you know, behind me, soul centered. I really do feel. I mean, this is based on the work of Dr. Frankel. That you know, we have a mind, we have a body. Those things break. Those things become ill. We return them back to, you know, the the earth wherever they go. Um, but we are a soul. And what I've seen in my own life, um, through guiding other people, also through having lived life, is that if we aren't at the center around that true self, around that eternal peace, around those unchanging, unwavering values, we will lose ourselves. We literally will lose ourself in the process. Um, I've seen so many people lose themselves to in a thousand different ways. Personally, it happened to me when I was 15 years old, my paternal grandmother lost herself to depression and, and she could never find herself again. And, you know, eventually um, when I was 15, she uh, completed suicide and I watched my family react to that. And my father over the next 20 years, losing himself, never finding that center, that spirit. And when I was uh, in my twenties, my father completed suicide and I've seen firsthand what happens when you can't come back to your center and mm -hmm. stand in the storms and navigate with a compass, with a North star that's yours, that nobody can take. Um, so that to me is the soul, again, whatever you call it. And that's why my wife and I started Soul Centered is to help people find that North star within them, the true self. And that's so I spend my days now helping people really navigate you know, not just the storms, but the storms when we realize we need it mm -hmm. the most. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we're doing some sailing when it's not stormy out, right? Right. Proactively. To learn how to sail. We, if we don't know how to sail, That's let's right. do it first in the in the non-stormy times. Let's learn how to sail before the storm. I can only promise you the storms will come. I've done 500 <laughs> funerals. I've guided people through <laughs> thousands of everything. Mm -hmm. it, they will come. The question is not if, but when. And the question is how proactive, or I would, Dr. Frankel says, there's only two ways to be in this world. You mm -hmm. either react or you respond. Mm -hmm. If you react, you're a victim of your circumstances. It's happening to you. 
Mm -hmm. And if you respond, no matter what's happening, you have a choice. And that to me is everything. Yeah. Cause the reaction comes out of all of our old patterns. So we may feel as if we're responding, but we don't have the freedom to really be able to be able to choose in that moment where we are simply operating out of what's already known rather than in and from that place that that is an expanded place that is that knowingness that there's more that there's another option well and as you teach a lot you know the energy level of that is fear and fear is a low vibrating energy mm -hmm. and when you make decisions out of fear when you live your life out of fear it's reaction you're not driving you, the bus you're responding you know going where life takes you mm -hmm. I, i've been in I've, I've been a part of seven startups and i would say half of them failed because of that low vibration decision making fear reaction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so we got to raise that up in our business life and our personal life and our you know relationships because nothing good ever ultimately comes from that low vibration of right. energy that's that's lovely. I, you know, I haven't um, heard it articulated quite that way. And it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm, I'm always working with people around how to make their idea real. And when we stay connected with the, the energy that that idea was born out of, that's the spirit, that's the, that's the creative intelligence. And, and it is, it is a high, high vibration. Mm -hmm. And then you know, how do we stay in that high vibration or move out when move out of fear when that comes in, you know, so fear based decision making is a great phrase. Yeah. And, you know, we'll, we'll always have fear. Like that's part mm -hmm. of the reality we live in. So, you know, it's not to set a, an ideal or standard so high that your listeners feel like they can't live up to it. No. Dr. Frankel talks about it. Like he was, he was uh, into flying airplanes and he would talk about it. They call it crabbing, but you're basically always off course making adjustments back, making mm. adjustments back. And in religious language, you know, originally sin didn't mean sin. It meant hate, which is off the mark. You're off mm. return. And so the word in Kabbalah to return is teshuva. It's return. It's not repentance. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's return, return back. What are you returning back to love to highest vibration to your, I call it based on Dr. Frankel's work and in the business world, your why yeah. your purpose, mm. your North star. That's high vibration. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. How are you working with people in doing that? Um, so like a lot of people um, during COVID, I shifted from in-person to virtual or phone. Um, so counseling slash coaching, working with them, uh, you know, in a kind of a semi-traditional way. I have been working very hard on integrating Kabbalah um, Logotherapy, Victor Frankl's work, and the Enneagram, because the Enneagram to me is a how to. You know, mm -hmm. I, I got a little tired of the religious world because it lives in these lofty ideals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want practical <laughs> tools. <right? laughs> That's why, you, you know, you brought the great point up about fear. It's like, no, it's not about we never have fear or jealousy or anger or any of those things of course we do of course and so to your so point what, so so yeah. tools show, talk to me about how and maybe it is in the enneagram for you how that um is a tool for navigation yeah i mean i just or, or returning enjoy. returning yeah. This is the Enneagram, just for your, your viewers or listeners probably have seen it, but it's a, it's a circle with nine energy types. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. I, I love about it because I'm not interested in a personality assessment. I don't think the world needs another label, just a <laughs> box to stick us I'm in. I'm on this. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an INFJ in the, in the uh, Myers-Briggs and mm -hmm. that's all I do with it. And Dr. Frankel would not have approved, you know, again, living in the Holocaust reduced to a number on his arm, 119104. He would not have signed off on another numbering system. Yeah, I'm, I'm with them. <laughs> but the Enneagram grows out of the Catholic mystical tradition, the Kabbalistic mm -hmm. mystical tradition, probably the Sufi tradition, geometry. I mean, it's just a, a kind of a fundamental um, understanding of there's nine energies in life. There's nine basic patterns, essentially. Mm -hmm. And you're going to react like one of them. And I say that very consciously because it's not that I'm an Enneagram eight. Mm -hmm. I react like an eight. You might react like a two. What does that mean? Well, we could get into the details, but what I like about it is it starts to give me a language 
and a roadmap mm -hmm. of if I'm on autopilot, if B is unconscious, where does he go? I react like an anger. So for uh, eight, so for me, that's anger. Mm -hmm. That's just my wiring. I'm just mm -hmm. wired. Like some people are like a 110 volt in your house. Eights are like 220 volts. <laughs> right. Right. And it can be really bad if I'm not conscious. Yeah. And it can be really good. You know, Martin Luther King was a harnessed enlightened eight. Uh, so, you know, not to talk politics, Donald no, Trump no. is probably an unenlightened eight. You can see a range of consciousness mm -hmm. in those two examples. And our job is to ascend off of, get off of autopilot, yeah. stop reacting, start responding. So this is a system. It's not the system to give me some, how do I do that and make mm -hmm. it personal? Mm -hmm. Is there a how to, how you get off uh, or, or how do you remember how you get reconnected? You know, I hear the, this is helps mm -hmm. me understand what, um, what my tendency will be on the, on this side of it, but on the other side of it, you know, what is this, this, does this offer you the same kind of um, tool set or pathway? Yeah. And it's almost mathematical because, you know, yin yang, it's all throughout history. You have to have a North pole always as a South pole, positive mm -hmm. always has a negative. And so it's the not contrast. bad. Mm -hmm. What's that? The contrast, the contrast, but it's a, it's a principle in physics. It's a principle in life. Mm -hmm. So what's the antidote to anger, you know, a forgiveness, a gentleness, mm -hmm. or I work with a lot of Enneagram nines. They're kind of the peacemakers. They're the lovely ones who get along with everybody. The downside, the shadow of that is oftentimes they don't say no, they don't stand their ground. They get their needs met. I see this a lot in certain types in our society. And so how do you take back your voice, your create your boundaries as an act of love, mm -hmm. right? So yes, there are tools. If you say yes, you need to say no. If you say no, you need to say yes. Mm -hmm. In very practical ways, giving people the antidote to their challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you. And, yeah. and, and then I know you work a lot in the place space of transition as people are moving you know, from life to death, from from existence to birth to, I mean, all we, we're constantly in transition is the reality. Yeah, we're constantly yeah. in transition. And um, I know that, that Viktor Frankl talked a lot about resilience. He taught the, and he lived resilience. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little about how that finds its place in, in your work and in the kinds of ways that you see the world? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the problem with a number, reducing somebody to a number, it could be a literal number, 119, 104, but I was just, I'm putting together a program right now. There's all kinds of numbers in our lives, like our weight. I know for mm -hmm. a lot of people, it's more than a number. It becomes who I am, mm -hmm. right? Our IQ, our bank account, our, and those are just literal numbers. Then you have all these labels, these titles. We're going through a kind of an era right now where we're challenging all of these boxes or labels or numbers. And, and I think the reason why we're doing is that we're intuiting that it's static, it's stuck. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a There's no evolution. <laughs> yes. And that to me, not to me, that for, at least from a Kabbalistic mystical perspective is idolatry. It's to say, this is who I am. Right. If I believed, if I believed that this was who I am, I'd be in big trouble because I used to have more of this. I lost it. Right, you, you know, mean and, hair. Now, for our listeners, because oh, most right. people will be Claudia listening to our hair. I, mean, I was, <laughs> I was pointing to my lack thereof hair, <laughs> and I used to have more of that. Um, but if I, my uh, another teacher, my Wayne Dyer, says this is the flesh suit, right? Mm -hmm. It's not who I am. It's what I'm doing while I'm here. Yeah. The moment we become static and say this is me, or this is you know my title, or I am my role, we are stuck. We are mm -hmm. stuck in a number. We are stuck in a box, and that is the slippery slope to hell. Mm. And we become why? stuck. Why? Why is it? Because it's it's exactly what Putin is doing to the Ukrainians. He has reduced his cousins, literally his cousins, even his brothers and sisters, to a number, to a country, to conquest. They're they're not brother. They're other or other mm -hmm. right they've made them other now they're a number you know hitler could not have killed six million human beings but he could put six million numbers into the gas chambers because they're numbers they're it's right. they're things right. you know martin boober the great mystic said there's only two ways to be in the world either i treat you like an it or a thou mm -hmm. and if you're an it i use you 
I can abuse you. I can step on you. If you're a thou, you're a spark of the divine, mm -hmm. whether it's your environment or whether it's the person sitting across from you or whether it's the country next door. Mm -hmm. And so when we reduce somebody, we reduce them to something static, yeah. to a stuck to a number. And we do that to ourselves. I mean, yeah. that's my work. I don't mm -hmm. work on healing countries, right? Or communities, or but you systems. could, but you could, <laughs> but, it's, but it starts with me. It like does. If, we, if we can liberate ourselves mm -hmm. and be in a marriage and see the thou and our spouse and our mm -hmm. children, our, it starts rippling. Yeah. And, and I saw, you know, what the consequence personally, when my father couldn't find that, and he believed I am my bank account. Well, guess what happened to his bank account? It disappeared. Right. And therefore he kept telling himself he's worth more to us dead than alive. <sighs> and if I could go back, I would say, dad, you're not those numbers. You're the noetic, you're the spirit, you're infinite. That's what you are. But he, did, he lost that. He lost we can't, it. That's an extreme, but I see it all day, every day. When we look in the mirror and we see the person staring back at us as me, mm -hmm. that's, that's just the vehicle. That's, so let's yes. remember. Yeah. Sorry, I, that's a lot. That's no, a lot. no, no. It's not, it, it's not, I mean, not at all. Um, it, it's very meaningful. I mean, it's meaningful. I was just reading this morning uh, an article about what happened in the Netherlands and uh, around the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and that they were they were trying. To, somebody, a historian, actually found the stories of these four hundred men that just got picked up on the street one day and never were heard from again. Um, and it and it made me once again reflect on the sense of otherness that is there. Um, because they were looking at how to kill mass numbers of people, you know, in a detached kind of way, which mm -hmm. is what that is. That's the only way we can kill somebody or something. And that's, you know, that's um, in Kabbalah, the word for evil is actually the word for broken or separate. Mm. And, you know, nobody starts out, Hitler didn't start out as evil. No baby, no mother's holding their baby, evil baby, mm -hmm. right? The separation, the brokenness, you know, we're here in Colorado and unfortunately there've been so many school mm -hmm. shootings. Those school shooters didn't start out as evil. They started out as innocent human beings who the, the separation, the loneliness, the brokenness mm -hmm. grew and grew and grew. And what we have to do is bridge that gap, right? We have to connect. That's the opposite. Yeah. And it starts with, you know, connecting to ourself, our soul, who the true us, mm -hmm. because, because the personality as you know, you know, is comes from the word persona. It's a mass <laughs> right. version of me. And, and look, I it understand is a part, it's a part of us, but it, it's but, not but, us. Right. But by definition, if it's a part, that means it's false. It doesn't exactly. mean it's bad. Okay. Okay. I, I I'm with you on that. Yeah. Because it's two plus two, two plus two always equals four always not if i like it not sometimes so that's a truth well the true me always has to be me it was the me at five and it will be mm. a me at 105 god willing mm. there's a piece of us that's true mm. now we have to put on these masks different roles different places i don't want to bear all be all to everybody at all times mm -hmm. so i put on a mask a persona a necessary way to navigate the world that's not the problem the problem is is when i start believing that i am mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am the rabbi. You know how much, I don't want to swear on your podcast, but how much BS <laughs> there is in the clergy with these. Yes, I do actually. People who think I am the father, I am the minister, I am the rabbi. No, you're not. You're not. That's what you do. Yeah. And then that, that makes you, and this is what people do on the other side of that is make that clergy person, the intermediary between them and their own spirit, between them and God. And, yes. and that is the same kind of separation. Right. My teacher used to say, um, she would talk about the, the I am. I mean, that's, you know, that's a fundamental conception with throughout, not just from her, but the I am, the, I, the essence, the I am. And that I am here, I am that I am that I am. And as I look to you, I see the I am. I am here and I am there. And when we start seeing that I amness in another person, then we can't be separate. And then we can't have judgment. And we, right. we gotta, we've got to go beyond what we think we see, the black and whiteness, to, as someone said to me this morning, where are the colors? You know, there's so much rich color. Where are the colors? Amen. 
sister, right on. Um, but you know, that name, that idea, at least from a Kabbalistic perspective comes from the Bible. When Moses asked God, what's your name? You know, what's, what's God going to say, Bob, like Joe, <laughs> like, what do you want? You know? So it's the best answer that could be given. It's a, yeah, I am that I am. And it's a verb. It's mm -hmm. back to our energy. Cause I know, you know, we really connect on many things, not the least of which is energy. A verb is movement. It's yes. energy. So the moment you put me in a box, the infinite becomes finite and it's not the divine. Mm -hmm. But the same is true with us. The moment I say I am white, mm -hmm. well, I'm not exactly white because I'm, you know, tan and whatever. <laughs> and I, I don't come, you know, I, don't, I come from the Middle East. I mean, that's my, so what am I? I have to be nuanced. I have to keep describing and describing and describing. I am male. I am female. I am all these things. That's these static labels or when we get ourselves into trouble, as opposed to mm -hmm. being energy and movement and evolving and becoming, right? That's divine. I remember years and years and years ago doing uh, an enlightenment intensive with a man named Jeff Love, real name, his real name, um, up at Cold Mountain Institute, which is now Hollyhock Farms. Um, and you were just sitting across from another person, essentially asking, you know, the question of, or stating, tell me who you are. And you would have the experience of going layer by layer by layer of who you think you are. And, and all of those roles, all of those recognitions, all of those thoughts you have about who you are. And then at some point, you would have that direct experience of I amness. And, and in that, that's the enlightenment. Yes. And once you have that experience in your own body, that's, you know, that is the embodied place and it's hard to forget it and you can, you can have other experiences and no, wait a minute, that's not the same. When I get into self-doubt, I know that's not the truth. Right. And that's a beautiful recognition to be able to have. That's the defiant power of the human spirit. You know, Dr. Frankel mm -hmm. talks about being reduced to literally didn't have a hair on his body. They shaved the eyebrows. They shaved everything. They mm -hmm. reduced him to his naked existence, he said. Mm -hmm. And yet he still had his defiant power of spirit. That is that moment of I am that mm -hmm. is you and is the true you. That's what we need to all get back to and remember from time mm -hmm. to time. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you have a book called um, Spark Seekers, Morning, M-O-U-R-N, in meaning, living in light. Could you speak a little bit about that? It's all about restoring flow after, after a death and, and, and how we carry that spirit of a loved one forward. And that it has particular meaning for me right now as a dear friend passed recently and um, in, in not easy circumstances too. So I'd love to hear you speak a little to that. Yeah, I wrote it a few years ago um, and it's really based on the work of Kabbalah. Spark Seekers is literally a Kabbalistic idea that says that when darkness descends into our life, that there is not only the possibility for light, but that is where you find true light is in the darkness. And it begins in a spark. And what the Kabbalists, the mystics said was there are always sparks buried in the darkness. And our job in this lifetime is to become spark seekers and to go into that darkness and find those sparks. You know, this is what Dr. Frankel talks about. And he comes from a Kabbalistic line of thinking. Um, many of his ancestors were Kabbalists. And so he doesn't name it as such, but he calls it meaning. I mean, so Dr. Frankel's entire philosophy is built around this idea of going into the darkness and finding sparks, finding meaning, finding purpose. Mm. And what I find with death is like we, that makes all make sense until it comes to the death of somebody we love. And then we say it's meaningless. And then we say it, that's true everywhere else except here. And what I have found in my personal life and in guiding thousands of people through death is that it's absolutely when we must find the sparks. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, um, you know, Lori, I've seen it again and again, those who can commit themselves to becoming spark seekers, whether they name it or not, mm -hmm. now they have a purpose. And my purpose is not to survive. That's not a purpose. Animals survive. And it's a starting point. You, you know, when you're immediately after your loved one has died, surviving is enough. Mm -hmm. And then you get mm -hmm. to a point when it's almost a betrayal of them, because mm -hmm. if you're not living and you're pinning it on their death, 
what do you think they will that energy what do you think they would feel if you stop living because they stop living that's when you have to go live more fully as i say love more fiercely not in spite of it because of it you're doing it for them you're doing it for yourself and you're doing it for the people around you and mm-hmm. this is how you defy the darkness this is how you def- i believe with every ounce of my being Lord, we can defy death we can defy it how so a teacher of mine once said a person dies two deaths once when their body dies And once when their story dies, and there's nothing we can do about the physical death, Mm -hmm. but we become a guardian of their story, of their Mm -hmm. literal story, their figurative story, what they stood for, who they were. Mm -hmm. And when we guard that, we've defied death. They're literally literally living on through us. Ah. Okay, so that's part of, I know you speak about um, generational healing and how how we carry legacy forward. So is that part of what you mean by that? Yes. You know, like I I redeem my father every day when I carry on the sparks, the light of his life, Mm -hmm. telling my kids, embodying his example. And I also honor him by leaving behind the darkness. You know, I said to myself, I will not be a third generation of suicide. I will not. I will make my stand no matter how hard it gets. I will never consciously choose to leave this earth I will break that in honor of my grandmother, in honor of my father, because that's healing a broken chain. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, I believe I'm repairing their energetic line. I'm I'm releasing their fear. I'm illuminating the darkness and I'm passing down a torch. You know, I call it carrying the fire Mm -hmm. to my children and they can take my, the torch farther than I could have ever gone. And that's Mm -hmm. the work we're here to do. I think there's also something that happens energetically in, in that you, you take that backwards too, that there's some kind of a releasing of caught energies that also takes place, caught energies for your grandparents, for your father, for, you know, that which has gone before. Yes. There's a great movie that a couple of movies that deal with that one is, um, the sixth sense remember from like mm-hmm. 20 years ago right. where it's only scary. It's like, it seems like a horror movie until you realize that it's a fear movie. And that right. if the uh, spirits that are caught here are just afraid and they they're trapped in this fear and the little boy's job in the, in the movie is to help them let go of the fear, release mm-hmm. the fear, the energy, yeah. and they can move on, but we get, they get stuck according to Kabbalah. Spirit gets stuck here, especially when it's traumatized. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so we can go back and re- help release it. My wife, Ariella, does a lot of work around generational healing and releasing mm-hmm. that stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So important. Did, when you were a rabbi, did you find... Uh, that, that one, this is not a question I've ever thought about asking. So let me see how okay, I want to craft it. Um, well, it has to do with the, the trauma of the Holocaust and... Mm-hmm. And it's not something that I spend a lot of time, certainly don't talk about, but certainly not even focusing on. And yet that is such a trauma in the capital T word trauma of a whole whole generation of people. And then moving forward generations after that. When you were a rabbi, did was that something that you saw, experienced, spoke to, and perhaps didn't then and maybe now? I, I, I'm curious yeah. about that. Oh, there's there's zero doubt from on every level that we can't even begin to imagine the consequences of a systematic annihilation of a people. I mean, there's been other atrocities, of course, and there still are, but this one was the most systematic extermination of human beings in the history of the world. It was absolutely and utterly inconceivable that the center of enlightenment, Germany, would then become the center of evil like this. And the Jewish people um, were wounded so deeply that you can see literally some of the aftermath of that. For instance, 91% of Jewish Americans have a college degree. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not because they're smarter. It's because they're scared. They they don't realize it, but because Hitler could take away everything, Mm -hmm. but he couldn't take away your education. Mm -hmm. So Jews have really put their stock into education because we've been kicked out of every country we've ever lived in, except America, Canada, and a handful of others. Mm -hmm. You start learning these traumatic lessons of, well, you better put your 
capital into things that nobody can take from you. And so mm. and they're, they're, on the one hand, that's turning lemons into lemonade, right? On the other hand, there is this anxiety around more education, more knowledge, more, and you can feel it in the Jewish yes. tradition. Oh, yes. And that also has consequences. So we've stopped focusing on spirituality and body embodied spirituality. Mm -hmm. And if you look at like extreme ultra-Orthodox centers of Judaism, it's all head learning. Yeah, yeah. Seminary. I know that I know the truth of that. And I'm, I'm thinking back in my own life, because uh, I grew up congregational Jewish, a uh, congregational Jew, and, and education was the thing. I mean, it, there wasn't a thought about going to college or not. It was, you know, it was an of course, and we're going to make it happen somehow. Yeah. Um, and, and I, and when I graduated, where was it? When I graduated, when was it, I guess? I guess it was graduating high school and, and wanted to do some other things first. Um, I remember my oldest brother and how angry he was at me. Yes. And th there was a fear, there was you a know, fear. That, an inherited fear. I signed up for the Marine Corps and my parents went ballistic mm. because their son was going to college and right. they like got a, they got a lawyer involved and a psychologist to get me out of it. And, you know, it's my, still my regret to this day that I didn't serve because it's what I, my soul wanted to do. And, mm. you know, we all have our own path, but to say that this is the path right? My, I'm pointing to my head for your listeners. That's, <laughs> that's one of our, our wisdom centers. But what about my body? What about my, my emotions? So, you know, if, let me just do a quick little uh, quiz here for you. It's very mm -hmm. simple. And I'll describe it so your listeners can hear. Take your finger, Lori, mm -hmm. point to yourself. Okay. okay. So Lori's pointing to her heart. And that's because when I do this, everybody points to their heart because somehow we intuit mm. that we are emotion. Nobody ever points to their head. Right, right, right. This, this and not, I mean, for me, right. it's not even emotion. For me, it's not about emotion. It's more about the spirit. And the, that yeah. for me is the seat of that. So yeah. this, this seat somewhere in our chest, our gut, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. a deeper, the, the defined power of the human spirit. But my point, though, is you take an entire religion and you point to the head and then you wonder why we can't keep butts in the seats, right? <laughs> because people, and you wonder why people are going to Buddhism and Hinduism and all these other isms, everybody's ism, mm -hmm. except our ism. You um, want an experience. You trauma. want to have a direct experience and not have an intellectual concept. Yes. And I don't want to just be immersed in trauma of we're dying. It's falling uh, apart. Right. Stay alive, survive back to our survival's not enough right and that was part of i wasn't allowed to date boys that weren't jewish you know i didn't i i understood it on one level but there's a deeper level that you're bringing to light which is the survival piece you know you're going to assimilate if you marry somebody if you date someone that's not even jewish <laughs> and it's fear like i've never once i have four kids i've never once told them don't smoke mm. i've never once what do I do? I live my life not smoking, living a healthy, conscious life. Now they're healthy and conscious. I don't lecture them in fear. I model love. I model, mm -hmm. model where I want to go. Yes, yes. Right. That's what we should be doing. And mm -hmm. they'll follow. Your children will follow. And if they don't, then they have their own path. And of course. Fearless. <laughs> less fear. Fearless. Fearless. Ah, wow. There's so many things that we could continue to speak about, about, you know, about purpose and meaning. And it, it, it's, it's, I don't want to just say it's a rich topic. It's an endless topic that we could spend time on. I do want to make sure that we let people know how they can reach you, how they can find you. Sure. Uh, pretty simple, defiantspirit.org, defiantspirit.org, or just Google Rabbi B. I'm sure you'll get to me. <laughs> <laughs> are too many of us buying for the title. <laughs> You have such a, um, a rich background and experience that you have brought together so that you have synthesized in a remarkable way. And I really appreciate the time you have spent here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Mm. Baruch HaLevi, Rab Rabbi B. <laughs> Thank you for being with us here today at Wisdom Talk Radio. Thanks, Lori. Thanks to your listeners. Mm. And thank you to our listeners for being with us today at Wisdom Talk Radio. Join us here regularly for more wisdom, discovery, and illumination. Well, remember, you can find us at your favorite place to listen to podcasts. 
And if you've enjoyed listening today, subscribe so you don't miss an episode episode and leave us a review because that helps more people find what we're doing here, helps them to access the wisdom and to then to transform the world. And for more about fast tracking your ideas to creation and to revenue, find me, Laurie Seymour, over at the BACA, that's B-A-C-A, institute.com. Take the quiz and find out your creative innovator's style so that you can turn your ideas into reality without missing another moment. See you next time. Thanks for joining us here at Wisdom Talk Radio. We wish you well in your conscious explorations. For more information and to join in the conversation, our website is wisdomtalkradio.com or at Wisdom Talk Radio on Facebook.